atmosphere. But somehow they talked to everybody in the southern hemisphere to being okay with it. So pretty much all the cool stuff happened down there. <coughs> Here is one of those uh, ones up close. Uh, you can see this is one of the French ones again with the center nacelle, the payload. Uh, it also has a, an aluminized cap on the top. There's a lot of experimentation to reject ice and frost uh, with a cap to reflect uh, radiated heat at night from uh, the Earth's surface uh, back into the little greenhouse there to keep the balloon from getting uh, colder than the surrounding air and allowing frost to form. Uh, and there was mixed results with that. Uh, basically, the end result was don't fly where it's damp, which is you know, anywhere there's clouds or weather well, below about 40,000 feet. Super pressure balloons aren't happy. This is uh, one of those in the air. Uh, you can see they're beautiful things. Uh, they are constructed very similar. Uh, this is one of the ghost balloons, I believe, or one of the other the previous. French balloons before they integrated them inside. You can't quite see it, but this is dangling a Yagi antenna down from the bottom here, uh, for, which is a very short duration test flight. And uh, they did a lot of shipping of these balloons from uh, France and the United States to New Zealand for and to other Pacific, Southern Pacific and Southern Atlantic Islands for demonstration and testing and innovation. And uh, a lot of times, uh, these are. They were stuck with a hundred of these things that they discovered on the first flight weren't going to work. So there's a, there a couple of interesting little field modifications that you saw they tried to do to get some use out of there. Now they're there and they've got a hundred balloons that have a leak in them. You know, how do you fix that? So there's a couple of references to leak patching that were successful, which is impressive for you know multi month flights to have a, a patch tape on your balloon. Uh, here is a launch from a trailer that actually uh, allows you to have the thing covered in a tarp and accelerate up to wind speed uh, and then take the tarp off so the balloon rises nicely straight up while you're hauling down the runway and just let go of your payload when the wind is going down your runway. And they had to do that a lot in the southern island flights because they pretty much had continual trade winds. <laughs> there it is up close coming out of the, uh, out of the car there. The black balloon is an indicator for the driver, so we can tell when he has reached wind speed, the balloon will be right over his head. Here is one in the back of a Jeep on its way out to uh, a launch. As you can see, the, uh, the environment for science was casual. <laughs> one in a mini moke. Uh, I can't remember where. A lot of the tropical places have these, but again, really nice, uh, nice scenery. You can see these actually have uh, arms out the sides for sensors for humidity and temperature, uh, which is impressive considering these balloon envelopes are really hard to get right, and they're very prone to fatiguing and failing from uneven stress distribution from uh, even just hanging your payload on them in the wrong spot can cause them to fatigue and fail. Uh, prematurely. This is one that's uh, of the size that's just a little bit bigger than what we're talking about, but it's a great shot. It's a uh, Pagios uh, geodetic experiment balloon. Uh, a lot of times mistaken for ECHO, which was an early telecommunications reflector uh, satellite. This was a purely earth science research sphere that was used uh, for optical measurements uh, to do some sort of geodetic distance measurement to very high precision across the entire hemispheres uh, back in the early 70s. It apparently increased our you know, millimetric distance between here and America and other continents to a high precision level. Here's a close-up of a modern French balloon, uh, still evolved from that same balloon with the nacelle down the center. This is a temperature sensor sticking out the side of one of them. See the uh, skirt that's bonded, uh, the wire going inside the payload, little shield, probably community sensor there. Here's a temperature sensor, same arrangement. This goes out here to a little thin glass arrangement that holds a thermistor bead. Um, getting precise temperature reading up there is very difficult. We don't really bother with this in amateur balloons, 
but your temperature sensors are likely not really giving you the real air temperature. Uh, they're likely skewed uh, anywhere from a degree to 10 or 20 by infrared from the sun. And it's really hard to get down to really ambient temperature um, up there where there's not much air density. Uh, this is the modern payload in the French balloons. It seems coming up there. Uh, it's about this big instead of the old ones, which were about this tall. Uh, this was a, uh, this is a great shot. This is uh, one of the French balloons. Uh, actually, it might have been in the Antler campaign. Uh, this was launched in Africa anyway. And we just uh, did zero questions. Just zero questions, OK. This was launched in Africa in the 90s, or actually in the mid 2000s. And uh, this was a photo of when they got to it to pick it up. I had been captured by a local tribe and was being held for reasons not explained. But the tribe had captured it and was uh, and had it securely guarded. <laughs> There's a, a modern launch of a French with much less exciting scenery. And there, this is an old chart. Of the spirit of Knoxville flight that James mentioned. I'll just let this go on uh, as background imagery here. What I'd like to tell you really about here is some of the detailed problems they encountered in all of those field campaigns. Uh, the, the balloons themselves, the envelope, is what we're going to focus on here uh, because that by far is much more difficult than the payload ever was. Uh, the, and we can go through this uh, whole mission. For example, we started a scent here. The failure of the balloon before it gets to a float is a whole category of failure pro of problems here. And uh, one of the primary ones they encountered was uh, the adhesive tape that they put the balloons together with was just coming apart. As it went up, um, they realized eventually that uh, all the adhesives they tried really weren't cutting it and often would cause them to get stuck together in weird places in the tropical heat and uh, they found a great amount of improvement when they went to heat sealing uh, the mylar film. Uh, fortunately mylar will not heat seal so they had to apply thermal adhesive between the mylar uh, tape and the mylar gores of the balloon uh, so that it increases your complexity a lot and you now have to heat seal something that won't heat seal well. The, once they did that, they were still finding problems where the balloons would be torn on ascent before they even got to float. They have holes torn in them. And it turns out uh, these balloons don't increase in size like your latex balloons do. So you know how the latex balloon climb rate is essentially a constant speed from launch till close to burst. If you have four meters a second at one kilometer, you're going to probably have four meters a second at 30 kilometers. But that's because your balloon increases in diameter and the drag increases as the air density decreases. These don't increase in diameter. So the drag remains constant, I'm sorry, their size remains constant, the air density decreases, so the drag drops, so they accelerate. The longer you're climbing a super pressure, the faster you'll be at the end of it, uh, which, as you can, uh, they reach speeds up to 10 meters a second uh, as you're getting close to 100,000 feet, say, 20 kilometers, which is, uh, they found, too high. You start getting flapping and un uh, oscillations of the film, especially when it's not fully inflated, like when the lower part is still limp like this, you'll uh, have a lot of uh, fatiguing going on to the point where it will tear holes in the thing even before it pressurizes. Uh, and primarily they found that that's triggered by the wind shear of the trouble pause where the jet stream is. When you go at high speed and you hit a high speed wind shear coming from the side, you get a lot of total force added to your system. So keep your ascent speed low. And the question is how do you keep the ascent speed low? Well, we got references to how they did that. Uh, one of the ways was uh, interesting. Uh, they simply put a jug of Freon on there and uh, let the Freon evaporate as it climbed. So 
it was basically gave barely any positive lift to the ground, put a jug of Freon on there, and then added a plastic balloon that was zero pressure to lift the Freon jug. So now you've got a complicated system with two balloons and jug of Freon, but it worked because uh, the zero pressure plastic balloon, as it reclined, the helium would overflow and it would lose lift. So at the same time, the, the Freon was losing weight, so you had these kind of counteracting each other for a while. And then when that all ran out, the zero pressure balloon basically served as more drag. It's basically a very little lift, but still some drag um, that basically kept the speed of the super pressures down to about 44 meters a second when they were reaching their float altitude, which is in the region that everyone's comfortable with. That was just one solution. Not many people did that complicated of a thing. Another problem was just simply that the balloon film would crack. Uh, there was a lot of formulations, a lot of plastics tried. The end result was mylar is awesome for cold performance. Uh, unfortunately, it's not awesome for a lot of other reasons. Uh, but cold performance and pressure, uh, it's great for. So after you get through this ascent, you go through a phase of increasing pressure until you reach the maximum steady pressure that you're going to inflate the balloon to as it levels off to a flow. And this phase is obviously going to uncover any weak spots in the balloon and either blow them out, stretch them, or uh, fatigue them even more. And this is uh, obviously going to pop all the ones that have too low of a tensile strength. For example, if you made this out of polyethylene, polyethylene would stretch too easily, has too low of tensile strength to withstand the you know, 50 millibar, 80 millibar pressure differential that some of these require. So again, mylar is great for that. It has a tensile strength uh, over 10,000 psi. Um, I don't remember how many megapascals that is, but it's good references for mylar. And it does the job for pressure. Uh, again, that's often exacerbated as it goes through the jet stream as things get they're very coldest at the whole flight. Uh, the, they have regularly seen on these flights that had good temperature sensors that the jet stream has you know, exposed them to as low as negative 90 C uh, in, in that region. So it's really cold there. The films that were too weak that they still wanted to try, they had some decent luck with laminating mylar to them. So you get some of the strength properties of mylar with some of the heat sealability of polyethylene, for example. Uh, the seams would come apart at this phase. If you had adhesive or adhesive methods that were too weak, uh, when you start to apply pressure, to keep them peel open. Uh, that was something that uh, was greatly improved by forcing manufacturers to do standard testing of their seam techniques so that they had a reference for this chemical, this compound, this time cycle on heater ran through pull tests in cold chambers and was rated properly. Uh, that alone improved the performance a lot of this transition into float. So now they're getting to the point where they're starting to get some floats here. And this is all in the, 19, the early 1960s, by the way. And up through about 1970, all this stuff that we're talking about here. And the, the stuff that we're covering is uh, runs the gamut of all the groups I talked about, the, the French, the US, uh, and all of the various programs in those categories of uh, the, the different weather bureaus of each country. The, let's see, once we've got through that, the seam consistency is a big issue. Like if you make a heat seal, it's got to have the same strength from end to end for all 20 seals on that balloon. And they found that just having procedures was not enough. They actually had to institute inspection quality controls for these things. And if you guys are going to build super pressure balloons, you've got to make sure your seals look consistent. That was one of the easiest ways they found was a simple, consistent, visual look. Uh, if you see deviations, you know, blemishes, it usually indicates a variance in the seal quality at that point, and you either need to reinforce it or to start over again. The uh, one of the real interesting ones was that the 
the way the payload is attached uh, can really affect how the load is distributed around the sphere. Uh, for example, if the, uh, you have the payload attached to little patches around the sphere, uh, that can put uneven loading on alternate panels where the patches land. Um, and a lot of times they had to completely redesign the whole envelope uh, because of this. For example, one time they used nylon for the cap and nylon uh, tape to transfer the load down to the payload. But it turned out that at negative 90, the nylon shrank so much that it ripped off of the mylon. Obviously not going to work. But they had never tested down to negative 90 until uh, through a bunch of you know, dozens of failures when they had tested down to negative 40. The, uh, and all these things I'm discussing, uh, when, I, when you get the, citation, the notes from this, are the citations to the papers written by the guys who did these tests. So this is really good reference information. I'm just giving you the highlights of what happened, and you'll be able to actually go and read more about it to use this information in detail. Uh, one of the really sad ones is uh, that plagues the balloons at all stages of pressurization is the fact that mylar creates uh, a problem in terms of handling. Uh, it's very sensitive to uh, folding and kinking, uh, to where if you fold it once and then intersect that fold with the second fold, it's almost guaranteed to create a hole where those intersect. Very tiny pinhole, needle hole, uh, where those two folds intersect. And that happens through everyday handling, folding, and shipping of mylar. If you've ever dealt with uh, uh, anything made of mylar, you know, any fold or, or wrinkle you put in it is in it forever, basically. And it leaves a mark. And that's something that is a problem when you have to ship from Texas to New Zealand. And you have to launch these things out in gusty winds, things like that. And it's something that still, to this day, is, is a problem that someday needs to be replaced with a different material entirely. But um, the best they could do was to simply make sure in the manufacturing facilities they didn't ever fold them, they didn't ever crinkle them. But the innovative way is like rolling them around cylinders to ship them. And, to, um, and at the launch site, you just had to assume that all the balloons had holes in them. You just couldn't trust the balloons when you got them there. Even if they were leak tested at the factory, you had to do another leak test on site. And uh, in several of the instances, the scientists decided that they would do the leak test and then never deflate it again before launch, just to reduce the handling even more on that. And that's it's difficult to test a balloon, especially once you get over that one or two meter size to find leaks that are the size of a pinhole. It does not release much helium in a normal amount of time. You're concerned about the amount of helium that's going to come through a hole over the course of a year. So that hole doesn't have to be very big to release a lot of helium over a year's time. So the leak testing went through many stages of evolution itself for uh, just a couple offhand that I recall reading about where putting a big plastic tent over the balloon with a mass spectrometer and a little vacuum thing at the top to see if there was any helium coming out for like a week. Uh, the very crude ones were just simply measuring lift and they found that was completely inadequate. There was no, they could not control temperature and humidity to a fine enough degree to use lift to measure that low of a loss. Uh, they tried uh, actually using spectrometers to go around the balloon and find leaks, leaks, but they did not have equipment that was anything smaller than, you know, suitcases at that point. And that was unwieldy to use out in the field. They actually put the balloons in pools of water and looked for micro bubbles to appear. And just ridiculous stuff. Uh, and they, there's all kinds of interesting info on that, particularly in the GOES program uh, citation whole chapter on the different leak, technique, leak test techniques they developed. Um, one of the problems uh, they discovered was that uh, in, if you can't launch the balloon immediately and you have to hold on to it, it's, and there's wind, you're going to get pinholes. 
And if the wind blows it and ripples that mylar, you might as well not launch it, which is a bummer. They basically say, don't do that. <laughs> that was uh, one of the things they discovered in the Yule Pacific campaign. Uh, and then the, let's see. one of the things uh, <coughs> the problem with early on with pinhole leaks was that they discovered that the mylar has pinholes naturally in its fabrication process. And rather than go around and try and find 20 little pinholes after you built your balloon, uh, the kind of very simple solution was to just make it of two half thickness layers of mylar. And that statistically will likely not have any of those 20 pinholes lining up with each other. It's pretty simple, but it, it uh, got them a nice long ways down the road of patching existing holes. And so we've gone through pretty much all of the major issues and a lot of the interesting solutions and problems in, uh, up through pressurization and level flight. Um, the, the next thing we've got is unplanned descents. And one of the major causes was ice and frost and water. And that's something that they, they tried and tried and tried for years to find solutions to because their goal for this global meteorological balloon system of 10,000 balloons was their dream uh, and proposal. They had to have balloons down to about a kilometer in altitude to get all the different layers of information back. Now, this is before they had a lot of satellite information. The satellite information they had could really only give them wind information where there was clouds. And uh, they, uh, even if you were not in clouds at nighttime, frost would frequently form on the envelope and add weight and cause the balloon to go down. If you'd entered a cloud, uh, there was a guaranteed demise to the surface. Just being in contact with the water in the cloud was enough to add enough weight to send you down, uh, if not forming ice uh, at, if you're high enough. And they tried water repellent chemicals, you know, oils, waxes, sprays, lacquers, you know, treatments, all kinds of things. And uh, the best they found was silicone oil, uh, furniture polish actually, uh, but even that uh, only lasted for a few rain showers. Uh, it, it did great in an actual rain shower, they said, you know, a balloon that controlled test, the balloon with the coating actually stayed in the air in a rain shower where the other one was taken to the ground quickly by the rain. Uh, but the third rain shower took the thing down just as easy as an one. And that was never resolved. Uh, the, it's never a coating they found that would perform adequately. So that was scratched. Uh, maybe today, some of the modern hydrophilic coatings, that are hydrophobic coatings that allow you to put your iPhone in the toilet safely, might be worth investigating. But that's to be seen. The frost and ice and water problems uh, were pretty much just accepted. As if you're going to apply these things below the stratosphere and the troposphere, which is where all our weather is, below about 40,000 feet, uh, you're just not going to last long. Anywhere from one to eight to ten days is the most you're going to hope for. As you get upwards towards the top of the troposphere, you may get lucky and avoid uh, you know, water for weeks, but you're typically never going to exceed a month's time, even at, you know, at the top of the troposphere. So uh, the, the grand plan for atmospheric profiling of these was shot with that water problem. So they scaled things back after that. Uh, the, they still had good use for them, but not 10,000 at a time. The, uh, the French had an interesting solution, though, um, that wouldn't work forever, but still worked better for longer than the spray, which was uh, to make your balloon waterproof. And since most of the world is oceans, uh, just let it hit the ocean dry off and come back up. And that's why all the payloads are inside. And it works. And it works decently. Uh, you get a, a decently long flight with that. Not as long as you would if you didn't go crashing down into the ocean all the time, but uh, it extends it much longer than uh, you would if you just 
orchards fail every time you hit the water. And you can see they're pretty neat looking. Uh, it also reduces problems on lawns, which you're all familiar with, uh, swinging payloads and ropes catching on fence posts and things like that. Uh, makes it a nice and neat package. The uh, So while the thing is at float, there's several instances of being up there for months at a time and not just uh, leaking and coming down slowly, which is what you'd expect if the helium was coming out slowly, it would be a pinhole or natural dissipation through permeability. Uh, but a few of them would just suddenly burst from seemingly a very stable, quiet flight, envelope would go like that and it'd come down. And uh, it took them a while to investigate these because you never knew where the thing was going to happen. And they were only ever able to re uh, recover one or two that had done this out of all the ones they saw do this. And uh, what they found was uh, several interesting things. Uh, one was that the top of the balloon's film up here at the top was 50% weaker now than it was when they manufactured it. 50% weaker tensile strength. And it was 50% weaker than the bottom of the balloon at the same age. The UV rays had weakened the mylar 50%. And uh, they realized that they needed stronger material on the top of the balloon. Something that took a lot of flights to figure out the cause for these random burstings. Uh, and it would have been almost impossible if you hadn't recovered that, other than theorizing the effects of these things. But they were surprised to find the top was so degraded and even three quarters of the way up was not even close to that degradation. It was basically the middle, uh, like 30 degrees of the top of the balloon was severely degraded and most of the rest of the balloon was hardly degraded. And that's why you'll see a lot of those have, if they don't have the aluminum cap, they have a much more opaque cap that's smaller, and that's the, the double or triple layer material of the same stuff the balloon's made of up there. The, uh, again, the, the adding the payloads to these envelopes was deemed for long durations to be a cause for fatigue as the sun cycled the pressure up and down. While it's designed not to have any extensibility, it's got to shrink and expand a little bit. It's the way the world works. Uh, and just a little minute expansion and contraction day and night uh, is enough to work fatigue in wherever um, there's any uneven stress points on the envelope. And they found that, um, to make a long story short, the best way to mount a payload um, was eventually determined to be to loop the, sh the string, like several strings, over the entire top of the balloon and back down to the payload through loops or tubes or basically uh, tunnels in the balloon material uh, so that the string was not attached at any point. It was just basically held over and could slide freely so the balloon could expand and contract and the string could slide uh, as the balloon stretched larger and smaller underneath the string. Uh, so the, the French eventually came to, or, I'm sorry, the US with the Nimbus campaign came to the conclusion of and now, that's not to say they didn't have a lot of successful hanging payloads from the center uh, with the ghost campaign, uh, but uh, this was later on they discovered the looping was better. And of course, um, one of the basic problems which I talked about last year is creep, which is where your plastic stretches uh, irreversibly when you pull it stronger, pull it higher than a certain tensile force. Uh, and the solution simply is don't pull it that hard. Uh, and it seems simple, but uh, before the advent of strain gauges that you could put on balloons, uh, it was very difficult to even tell how much pressure they had in these balloons uh, for a long time. Very few of the flights had pressure sensors on them because of the crude technology. And that's where a lot of our developments today that we can add to this, uh, a lot faster innovation and a lot better diagnostic info for trying to be super pressures. If you really want to know what happened, we've got the electronics to give us a lot more info than they ever had in the past. So one thing we'll take a look at here, winding down here, is 
just a little chart of the balloon program, just to show you guys what we're talking about here, these programs. So you see here, is that a laser pointer? So, this is uh, arranged uh, chronologically from top to bottom here. You see these are the, the general name of the flight program. These are all small superpressure balloons that are below, that are in the less than 10 kilo payload range usually, uh, or in the diameter of less than 10 meters uh, usually for this list, which is the range that you want to go to uh, high altitudes uh, above the airways for us today. Uh, so even the ones that had really heavy payloads here, so there's a, a payload mass, it's not 18 kilos, but the size here of this one, the diameter is 10 meters, which would bring a like a three kilo payload to like 90,000 feet, which is great. Uh, you can see lots of great data. This I've compiled, it took me a long time to compile this from all the different sources and papers. Uh, even the existence of these programs uh, was buried. You know. In fact, one of them, the TCLB here one, I found that last night. <laughs> I was doing the final touch up. I did a, a search for this twirl flight, and they referenced TCLB, and I was like, I wonder what that is, just for the heck of it. I was like, I can't believe I missed a program that had 320 flights. But the problem is this information is all scattered in academic journal articles, in archives of governments, uh, and though a lot of it is, uh, the government stuff in the U.S. anyway, is public domain and freely available. Uh, most of the academic journals and other government publications um, are copyrighted and are not freely available and hard to get. And um, that's one of the reasons why the ballooning industry has not really innovated on the balloon part in a long time uh, at the small end here. And something that I'm trying to correct uh, by simulating all this information and republishing uh, the relevant data and the results and how to do all this stuff in a format that everybody can access through normal channels, uh, that they don't have to jump through the hoops I did for the past five years to find this information and put it all together, even just to get the picture of what was done. You know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel if it's been done 320 times and perfected. Uh, to give you an idea of the scope of these things that most people have never heard of, the total of all, these are all the flights that I know of, that I have been able to find over five years of small super pressure balloons programs. Uh, the total flights on this table, 1,681 flights. That's a tremendous amount of science and development and research. And these, these are not cranked out like assembly lines. These are all handmade balloons, these programs, uh, spent a lot of time to develop this stuff. So the results are something that I, I'm looking forward to doing and hopefully in, in some sort of open access method. So that's about it for me here today. Just throw up my contact info. You can see that. Any questions? Um, did you come across any use of silicon pressure sensitive adhesives for bonding of mylar film? Silicone? Um, not specifically that I remember off the top of my head, but I can look that up if you're interested in it. Mm. I've got access to quite a few. I use them commercially for mm. projects, medical, medical electronics, and medical sensors. Interesting. I was wondering if we could experiment with some for bonding of super pressure balloons because they read the data sheets. They're supposed to retain film strength down to about minus 90 C. Nice. And, and they'd be bond. flexible, wouldn't they? Yeah, they're yeah. flexible and they bond to low surface energy polymers like um, everything apart from PTFP. That's the kind of materials science development that I'm hoping has happened in the past 30 years since this stuff has kind of stagnated. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we need to talk about. So I'd love to talk to you about the silicon adhesives and see where they are these days. Can we call back to the um, table? So you've got um, 10 meter gram balloons carrying about sort of 17, 18 kilograms. What sort of. Oh, so sorry, I missed the place I've just got the So it's about 20, yeah, 20 kilograms. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
with any of them very particularly high, like the models and pressure buildings nowadays. Uh, like the ULDB ones yeah. for NASA? Um, um, or were they just interesting? The, I've got all the data that I know of in my head is here on the table. So the, uh, and this is better at remembering than I am. Uh, where's the altitude? Float altitude here, kilometers, 21 kilometers. They're not very high, no. Uh, and typically that's because <coughs> They didn't have miniature electronics back then. They had heavy payloads. They couldn't. And I there's larger superpressures that a lot of programs out there that I filtered out for this talk. So um, the larger balloons did go up to much higher altitudes, um, but the small ones just couldn't because they didn't have light payloads that were useful. Okay. I read that uh, there was a talk back in Australia. I was working on that one about a French program around out that was floating around out in Africa that had about. Or 20 balloons, like mm -hmm. what they found was some of the probably this early, one, probably Concordia. Probably, well, no. one of the early bursts they found was actually gravity waves on mountain ranges yes. where the balloon would suddenly rise by about two or three k's. That would kill it, yeah. Just goes around and you can't avoid that. So you go to the ending out in the street, what, what do you do? Well, you don't go near mountains and bridges, <laughs> 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 yeah. Basically, the super pressure balloon is, uh, is a very uh, delicate balance of uh, material uh, creep limit and your required daily super pressure. Uh, they're very close. You have to run right up at the edge of stretching beyond, uh, stretching to failure uh, to maintain enough super pressure every day with our current materials. So if you get pushed high, that means the pressure outside of your sphere is going to drop farther and farther, which means your differential pressure is going to go up more and more and past the creep limit. And the balloon will not respond immediately severely to this, um, but it will continue to rise typically because now it's going to act like a rubber balloon. As it goes higher, it's going to now start enlarging, which is going to increase its lift and go higher and faster. So you're going to start your final climb once you pass the creep limit. Uh, and you might get, you might bob up and down a few times, basically going into that creep limit and back as, as it stretches until the point of no return and then continues on up to burst. And that's what happened in the mountain waves where you get vertical air currents blowing your, your stuff all the way up beyond its limit. Any other question? So we actually have been doing this, haven't we? Yes, you have with PK balloons. Floating PK balloons, in theory, are recreating a lot of this. Not by mistake, but not really with it. Well, with intention, but without a lot of the engineering behind it. Do you think that's because the materials have changed, or that we've miniaturized things to allow us to fill it off? What do you yeah, you are, uh, that's why I, I love the PK balloons, is you're, you're flying super pressure balloons there. When they succeed, they are super pressure balloons. And, um, the reason why most of them didn't succeed for a long time was they're hard, as you found out. It's very the margin for success is very narrow, and uh, I think you you just found that right combination where you get just enough lift, just the right payload weight, and uh, if you're lucky, you don't get water. But a lot of times, when you get these long duration ones, uh, and they eventually come down, one of the first things you might want to look at is what was the cloud cover like where they came down or immediately before there for a little while. That's that's a good indicator of, of frost and ice accretion is a slow descent after a successful flow. But I, I'll let you know, um, the hallmark of a true super pressure success is surviving through a sunset without a change of altitude. So that's uh, that will be the next thing to see if, uh, if, if has anybody felt that? Now? Really? Congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, Richard did it, one across France. Did yeah, really, I think maybe they've got off a bit. <laughs> but it sat quite flying some big cigar shit. Yeah, yeah. So, but really? it, I mean, he's just making a tube from the ceiling. Yeah. Well, not that one. It's a, the, the, the Mylar party balloon one that you launched oh, right, okay. across Paris, near yeah. Paris. I mean, we lost that one because we ran out of batteries. Yeah. We, they, and then the one in Scotland, again, we did from Kent. That flown over one night, though, hadn't it? The one in Scotland? Yeah, it flown overnight. So, so we launched yeah. in the evening. Mm -hmm. Survived yeah. the sunset and sunrise, yeah. and then was lost over Scotland because the batteries ran out. Yeah. So they can they, they can do a night a day night cycle. That's right. We actually have. Is there any other questions we have to finish yeah. up? Right. Yeah.
Seven minutes to escape from here. Um, thank you all for coming along today. Um, I hope it's been a, a good a good day of sort of meeting people that you haven't met before. Ballooning happens to be a bit of an internet-based thing, so therefore it's got quite a lot of. And you don't know who everyone is, just nicknames and names, and maybe the occasional launch photos. It's nice to meet everybody. Um, any questions? Or any, what I'd like to see, actually, is rephrase 